Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Soda Series Live. I'm Kristen Bell from the Strategic Development Team here at Adobe, and I'm joined by Tom Beck, Executive Director of Soda. Hi, Tom. Hey, Kristen. It's great to see you. I'm uh, see I'm you. sad we're we're not together in person. For those of I you know, who, for those of you who follow the show, we we had a great opportunity to be together in person, and we live streamed our session last month uh, from Austin at South by Southwest. And it was amazing to be together, but we're, we're back again virtually. Yeah, it was so awesome. So awesome to be in person. We'll be doing that again later this year. So yeah. uh, there will yeah. be another one of those. For those of you joining who are not familiar with Soda Series Live, this is a collaboration between Adobe and Soda, the Society of Digital Agencies, where we bring you in-depth conversations with creative leaders from all around the world. Our goal is really just to help inform and inspire creatives like yourselves and maybe give you a glimpse into the minds of some of those influencing the industry today. Uh, so we're super happy to have you here with us. For those of you who do join us regularly though, we are spinning things up a little bit today and doing it um, different. So today we have um, a Soda member agency founder leading the conversation with an Adobe exec. So we just flipped the, Flip the format on its head for this one. Uh, so, Tom, what do you say we just dive in? You want to go ahead and introduce yeah. Michael? Yeah, let's do it. So, I'm I'm thrilled to uh, introduce Michael Lebowitz. Michael is a longtime friend and colleague in the soda community. He's the he's the founder and now executive chairman of Big Spaceship in Brooklyn. Uh, one of the one of the original. I mean, definitely an OG digital agency, at least back in the back in the day, um, would, would call them more of a, of a modern agency and consulting company working with progressive global brands. Um, Michael is also the uh, one of the founding members of the Soda community uh, and, and on our board of directors. So we're, we're thrilled to welcome Michael today and really appreciate him kind of leading the charge on this conversation with with Scott. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, y'all. It's great yeah, to see you Yeah, welcome. Both. It's great to see you. When I was doing the preparation for this, I realized you were our very first Soda Series Live guest. Oh, that's oh, right. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. It's back in what that was around, back. like, we've been almost oh, a year and a half or two yeah, years or we so. we started it. Oh, I... 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, so it's great it was to have you back. Deep, deep COVID, which is why it might have slipped my mind. It, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so uh, today, Michael is going to be speaking with the one and only Scott Belsky. Yay! Scott is the founder Ooh. of Behance. Uh, hey, Scott, the platform that is loved by creatives around the world. He is an investor and advisor in numerous startups. He is the author of both The Messy Middle and Making Ideas Happen. Scott served as Adobe's chief product officer for five years, is now our chief strategy officer and head of design and emerging products. So welcome, Scott. Thank you. And it's yeah. awesome to be here with Michael, someone who I've known and chronicled his career for 10 plus years, too. So it's kind of a... Uh, I think we're pushing 20, closer. Scott. <laughs> I, know, it is. I think it's a little closer to 20 now. Oh, 20 oh, years probably. Cool. Yeah, I guess 2000. We happen yeah, to do that. I know we happen to do that. I still think of the early 2000s as like 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. I do too. Isn't that how we stay young? We sort of mm -hmm. just like, you know, mm -hmm. still living in the 90s. Oh, you all stay young. I get yeah. so, uh, so extremely gray in this, uh, in this. <laughs> oh, you look great. Quartet we have here. One last quick item before uh, we dive into the conversation. Tom and I are going to jump off camera, but we'll be in the chat uh, for those of you with us live. Please feel free to drop some questions in for Scott and Michael, and we'll do our best to service as many of those as possible during today's conversation. Uh, so without further delay, Michael, Scott, we'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Hey, man. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. It's really good to see you. Likewise. It's really good to see you. So uh, I'm going to dive in because there's like really rich stuff for us to talk about and uh and I, like it's especially fun for me to get to talk about this stuff with you because I've been uh, I've been noodling on it quite a bit myself, and um, I I know that you'll have uh, you'll have really helpful thoughts and lenses to put on this. Um, so the first and probably the most obvious uh, topic of the moment is generative AI, and uh, you wrote a piece a little while back called uh, the era of creative confidence which I think is really interesting. Um, 
And so I guess I'm asking both from your perspective and also from the sort of larger Adobe strategic perspective, uh, you know, if you could kind of talk about why you think this is a moment for creative confidence. Yep. And for me, I guess to like tee it up a little bit, I think it the lack of confidence comes from a lack of separating craft from creativity. Mm. And th those are two essential things, but we can't look at them as a single monolith anymore. Uh, and I'm wondering, I guess, if, if you agree with that distinction and, uh, and just in general, you know, how do you, uh, how do you convey that confidence to people who might be feeling a little bit uh, less than uh, confident in this, in this world of instant creation? Well, I think that, um, you know, I oftentimes think about uh, creativity that moves us is effective creativity, right? It's something that makes us right. feel something. And at least for me, it's always about story. You know, it's process or story that moves me about something. When I see something in a gallery, you know, it's like what I learn about the artist and what they went through. And, you know, and, and the more you learn, the more you understand the story, the more you start to appreciate what you're looking at. And I believe that that's, listen, every product, I always feel like you can tell a little bit about the dynamic of the team that made it just by using the product. You can tell who didn't talk to who and who didn't get along with whom and whatever. Similarly, when you look at a piece of, you know, any sort of creative work, I think you can get a feel for whether there's soul and story behind it or not. And I think that in this world of abundance, where there'll be so many things that catch our eye at every corner, um, much of it made by robots maybe, and we'll talk about that in a second. I do think that we're gonna crave craft. I think we're going to crave story. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that a lot of even brands with their campaigns and everything else will start to capitalize on story and process as a way to engage people emotionally because that is not a new idea and that's always worked. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that the, um, the sort of, I don't know, the pithy things of, oh my gosh, you know, creatives are gonna be out of work and whatever, uh, I, don't, I don't buy it. I do believe though that the bar is going to be at a different place for us. And we're going to have to, as we always have, like work to tell stories and make people feel something. All the stuff though, that we do after that work, like, oh, and by the way, convert this into seven different formats. So I need it for TikTok and Facebook right. and Instagram and oh, and 120 different languages. Oh, and by the way, can you please acculturate this so that we use red in China, but we don't use red in India and like, you know, all these sorts of things. I think we're going to get a lot of help from AI on that stuff. And, you know, and, and if you were just billing hours for that, well, maybe you need to be billing your hours and bill more for the creative craft story part and, uh, you know, and, and, and have a better process to automate a lot of the other stuff. And so, um, so when I say creative confidence, what I'm trying to say is that peak creative confidence for most humans is like six years old. And, uh, you know, everything you do, it's right. like you show it up to your parents and teachers and they put it on the fridge and you're so proud. And then you gradually realize that, oh, wait, like, I don't have a lot of the skills that the best people do. And, oh, there's something called critics, you know, and and all that stuff sort of hits, <laughs> <laughs> it hits you in the face. And, and then sadly, like creative confidence goes down for most people unless you go to design yeah. school or, you know, become like a true master of the craft. Um, and so... I am, uh, I'm excited about more people feeling more confident for longer creatively. And I do think generative AI does that and we can get to that. But again, like story, story, story. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It, it's funny. Uh, we have a Slack channel uh, at Big Spaceship for showing off work and it's called The Fridge for just that reason. It's just, it's just you know, that's when, that's when you are completely without uh, inhibition about showing what you've made and uh, without self-criticism it's uh so I, I i'm in total agreement with you. you you take away the friction from the process and you'll get all new storytellers who for whom the craft part of it was a barrier to entry possibly um but i think that there's I guess I think there's a real, you know, there's the there's the 
pragmatic stuff that you're talking about. And I can't wait for that. Like, please put it in my veins right now. All the resizing, all that stuff that we've done for so many years. Like, let's, let's, uh, let's offload that to computers. That's what they've been you know, supposed to be good at all along um, and, and do it better than we do it. Um, but when you've spent a, a tremendous amount of time, you know, maybe at design school learning all of the incredibly detailed nuances of typography um, and then something pretty darn good that will clearly be better soon can be pushed out uh, in near, in a near instantaneous way. And that may not be there right now, but certainly that's, that's on the horizon. Um, there's got to be like, I like to think in, in a world of abundance that everything just creates new opportunities and some of the old opportunities go away and that's always sad and challenging, but the, the new opportunities always uh, are, uh, are greater in number and are ultimately an opportunity for people who believe in the craft to find new ways to craft. But I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on kind of how that's playing out. Like, are we just raising up the, the amateur to a new level of potential expression um, or are the professionals also going to have sort of professional craftspeople are going to have uh, new opportunities here as well? Yeah, well, the way, the way we think about our approach at Adobe is we've kind of realized that the full spectrum of our customer base, you know, goes from the very process oriented, um, typically the professional who cares deeply about the process that it takes to get something and on a pixel by pixel level has a vision in their mind's eye and wants to manifest that in the work. And those people want every precise capability. And, and when we ever block them from not being able to do something that's exactly what they want, they get angry, right? And so that's the precision right. performance process oriented creative. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the outcome oriented customer and they just want mm -hmm. something. And they'll start with a template, they'll change the text and they'll be done. They don't care if the font is this or that, you know, they don't really care if the background is blue or red. It's just like, you know, I need to get something done and done fast. A lot of SMBs who are using products like Adobe Express, you know, that's all they care about. Yeah. And, um, and that's okay. Like, let's not pass judgment. Like they need to be able to tell, uh, no, no. Their, you know, their story as well. And, um, and so there's a spectrum here. Now, what we're finding is that a lot of these outcome oriented customers end up having the desire to become a little bit more precise and to do something mm -hmm. that they can't do. And at that point, they either engage a creative professional to help them um, or they take the plunge, you know, and develop a skill set and go deeper. So, right. so as we're developing the technology around the generative AI offering that we have, which is called Firefly, we're thinking about how do we do this for the outcome oriented creative? And then on the process oriented, precise creative that wants everything to be non-destructive and be able to go and edit and, and, and really with great minutia, like manipulate the prompts and whatever else, like we want to make sure that the tooling goes in that direction. And I actually think that's something the market hasn't done. Um, right now, it's still focused just on the outcome side. And so as you see some of yes. our features hit Photoshop, for example, you're going to be able to, um, if you have an image and you just need a little bit more of that image, uh, it's kind of an impossible task to do that quickly because you have to literally like, you know, think about what the pixels would be to extend. AI can do that automatically. Like, why shouldn't we be? Yeah. And if you have to like fit a format, why should you have to crop it unnecessarily? Why can't you just extend the image? That's called outpainting, you know, we call it. Yeah. Um, and so things like that, uh, you know, will that, that will be that will be the philosophy that we take, you know, for, for both sides of the spectrum, which I think is, is what you're asking. Yeah, and, and that's really interesting. It, 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 it begs a question that I personally wanted to ask. This isn't on my, uh, my list of uh, topics, but I think you'll, you'll get a kick out of it it's too. It's our hour, we is, can do whatever we want, right? It's our hour, yeah. Sorry, Tom, Kristen, we're going rogue. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, we, whenever there's a huge shift, you know, the emergence of the web and particularly the commercial web, and then, you know, the, the iPhone and the App Store in particular in 2008, um, there are 
and even smaller disruptions like Instagram, for example, um, you have tools that were not designed for that changed world having to operate to try to make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, when I was coming up, we were using Photoshop. Sometimes we were using InDesign to create websites. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I'll talk to younger people at the company or elsewhere, and, you know, they kind of laugh at it. Now they kind of look at it as a design aesthetic, uh, you know, the, the websites of, of the, you know, mid, late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and a lot of the quote unquote design aesthetic was just we didn't have the tools to do it better and uh you know it was a it was a challenging time uh in a lot of ways and it, it takes a good amount of time for mature tools to develop mm -hmm. so you know an individual is usually working inside of photoshop because it's about you know meticulous pixel level work but photoshop isn't a good tool for pro digital product design where you have you know thousands of elements and a multiple of that of states of each of those elements which begs you know more multiplayer uh, and, and now we see uh, you know you all have acquired figma which i think is really exciting and uh, but this change with generative ai and you started to touch on it with firefly which i've started to play with a little bit and i think is really exciting but I wonder if what happens after the period where we're taking the familiar tools and adding functionality into them, what are the, what are the native tools going to look like? If you can kind of prognosticate as a product guy a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what I've been paying attention to on the native tool side is the prompts that are being used to make the most sophisticated outcomes in products like Firefly and Midjourney and others. And what's interesting is that the prompts are actually very technical. So people are saying, you know, I want to use this lens, you know, with this effect and this, they'll even refer to like Lightroom presets and stuff like that. And so in essence, I mean, that's a trade, uh, that's a craft, like even knowing right. what what you know, different millimeter lenses are capable of is not like widespread knowledge. Um, that's a craft right. in and of itself. And so in some ways that's kind of, I mean, it's almost like the move from physical film to digital, right? Where mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. who use early stage digital cameras were seen by the physical photographers as like traitors, you know, you're cheating. Like, mm -hmm. how could you do that? And now it's happening where digital photographers are seeing people use these terms and prompts and they're like, you're cheating. That's not real photography. <laughs> How could you do that? And it's like, don't do, doesn't everyone see the patterns here? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, so the thing is, is that ironically, I think that the native AI first tools will have a lot of these instrumentations in them. Like, you know, we're only limited by what we can think about prompt wise. And so it's kind of right. ridiculous that right now we're just like, it's an empty box and like whatever we put in there is the prompt. Like, why aren't, why aren't you seeing style galleries of styles that you can leverage? And by the way, yeah. there's a monetization opportunity there because the people who made those styles should get freaking paid for their styles, right? Um, totally, and why can't you totally. see Lightroom presets and apply those to your prompts and why can't, and you're suddenly like adding things into that box through a more of a discovery process and a new, you know, novel way of, of, of presenting the instrumentation. And you know what, the prompts are going to be a lot better. And guess what? The outcome's going to be a lot Absolutely. better. And it's very analogous to the previous worlds of creativity that we know. So the, the one build I want to, to add, just because I want to see this happen in the world and, and maybe I can uh, incept it into your brain a little bit and have Adobe start playing with it, is what about being able to adapt the interface itself of the product to the way that you work? So if you are a Lightroom person, you have a whole new interface and you say, okay, but, but make this like the Lightroom interface because that's what I'm most you know comfortable with. Or... I really like physical dials. Can you like do your best to replicate this into a, a, a you know that kind of interface? Or I want it just a, a word processor. Yeah. And so whatever people feel most natural in, to create in can be their interface because you know really there's, the only thing preventing that is just being able to make the right associations with the right functions. 
I think that's I think it's, it's interesting. It's um it's a it's almost like skeuomorphic, you know, thinking to some degree. It's like right. give give people an interface they're familiar with and they'll understand how to use the new technology. I mean, the other thing though is that when you look at Lightroom and Photoshop and Premiere Pro and these products, we are bringing generative AI in. And I have to say, like when we first first started thinking about it, well over a couple of years ago, um, we were thinking more like plugins and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We have totally pivoted from that. Now the teams are really thinking about native integrations at every point where you're going to need it. So, you know, when you select mm -hmm. something in Photoshop and, uh, and you have the option of content aware fill or removing it or whatever, that's the moment where you should also have generative options and generative right. options for whatever you selected can be a whole number of things. But that's, I feel like that's an example of a more native integration as opposed to like, some plugin that lets you like, you know, conjure up an object with a prompt and like throw it in somewhere as a layer. So, so I think right. you know, the, the good news is that we've gotten the teams, our product teams over the hump of thinking about this as an extension and thinking about it more as mm -hmm. like native core. And so hopefully if someone wants the Lightroom interface, but they want the power of generative AI, they could just use Lightroom. Um, and that, that's right. our goal. Yeah. Right. Very cool. So, Shifting to maybe a little bit of the other side of this, there are certainly a lot of um, legal and ethical uh, topics and concerns that are popping up. Uh, I, I personally, I, I have to admit, I, I haven't really landed on a, a, a personal position on this. You know, how much of someone's work is, uh, you know as an input into something, uh, how much should they be, you know, acknowledged? And, you know, uh, it's, it's a really challenging question. It's, it, it's certainly going to be one of the sort of legal philosophy questions of our time. Um, creators should be credited and should be paid for the work that they do. That's never been a question in my mind, but it gets really, uh, it's really blurry when you get to your work was an input along with maybe thousands or millions of others to achieve an output that is potentially unique. Um, it's, it's very, uh, very complex, uh, too complex for the likes of me. Um, but then there's also, you know, a question of, uh, of bias, which I think is a really important and immediate question being built into some of these things. Um, and I'm just curious, kind of what's what's your take on it, and what are you still learning about this? Uh, because yeah. it is it is complex uh, at at uh, at its core. Well, this is uh, I have a lot of feelings on this one, so get ready. Uh, but I, I um no I, I a couple of things first, just the easy parts first. So we decided to build Firefly not by scraping the open internet, but only using publicly available data sets that were like not copyrighted um, uh, and, or, or stuff that we actually had explicit license to be able to use. And we, mm -hmm. we call it a clean data set. And that's become very important in the industry as we talk to our customers, especially agencies who are attesting to their clients that the work yeah. that they made is like truly risk-free for them to leverage for all marketing purposes. They can't, Feel, they don't feel comfortable leveraging some of these models out there that were made with like con, uh, no consent uh, at all type of uh, you know sources yeah. of assets. So that's one decision we made. Another decision that we made was really focusing on the bias thing. And we've actually done a lot of fine tuning of our Firefly models such that your prompts, you know, don't always yield uh, you know, a white male for a doctor or like, you know, other historic mm -hmm. biases based on the, 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 the volume of content that was scraped and used for training of a lot of these other models out there. You know, we've tried to really think about bias and we've built technology that actually helps compensate so that there's less bias, you know, in the system. And we have ways of the community reporting search terms that yield things or, or prompts that yield things that seem to be biased in some way. Um, so we're trying to also, uh, do that because that's what our customers also want too. Not only do we believe mm -hmm. that that's right, but that's also the demand. And um, and then and then, but then you take a step back and you're like, what is going on here? I mean, this is sort of like a Napster moment in my mind, um, right. more than an Uber Airbnb moment. And I'm going to compare the two as a metaphor in a minute. But you mm -hmm. have you know 
Drake in the weekend, uh, everyone saw the AI drop that happened. And now there's another one featuring Rihanna. Um, you have Grimes coming out being like, I'm going to open source my voice, but just make sure you give me 50% of whatever you make using it. Um, it's sort of a free for all right now. And this is, you know, voice is widely available with 15 seconds of footage of any of your voices. I can essentially make you say anything for an entire feature film, right? There's also the technology now to map likeness. So mm -hmm. I can take your, your, your body based on footage and I can actually make a, you know, I, I can make unauthorized sequels to movies that I like. I can make new episodes in succession that didn't even exist with, based on my own script. Yep. And so then you start to wonder, like, what is, what is the future of IP? You know, if anyone can make anything using anyone's likeness, like, should your voice be copyrightable? Should your identity be IP that is protectable? And there's a lot of ambiguity right now in, um, yep. in the law, you know, that just needs to be updated to accommodate all this. Now, also, as someone who founded Behance, you know, which is now 40 plus million professionals showcasing their work online, which you need to do to get attribution, credit and opportunity for your career. And yet there are some, you know, uh, sort of models out there that I would call the dirty models that basically scrape the Internet, including a lot of artists work. And you can use the artist's name as a prompt to get something in those models without yeah. the artist's compensation nor permission or attribution. And that doesn't seem right to me. And, uh, and so, so the, the analogy is that, you know, some people would say, oh, it's like more like an Uber Airbnb thing where it's just going to become okay. Like it doesn't feel right now, right. region by region, people are fighting it, but eventually it will just become okay. I happen to believe it's more of like a Napster moment where everyone's okay. stealing music right and left and everyone feels like this is just the new, new. And eventually, you know, soon, um, there's going to be like a crackdown and there's going to be an opportunity for musicians to continue to, mop, to, to monetize their work, uh, maybe not as well as they did in the previous era because technology has changed and shifted. But the Spotify's yep. and Apple Music's of the world will change that and also make it easier for the consumer. I mean, actually, it's easier to hear a high fidelity song that you know is the actual recording on Spotify than it was on LimeWire or whatever we were using in college, yep. you know? So... So I think that um, wh when it comes to styles and likeness and voice and all that kind of stuff, we need to have that sort of Napster-like realization and we need to have new technologies like the Spotify's of the world that emerge to solve the problem. I love that analogy. Uh, I, I think it's really good. Uh, and I agree that it's not Airbnb, Uber, that, you know, a couple of policy shifts and, you know, We'll just get used to it and it'll all work itself out. Um, there's also an element of you know, the the progress of this is happening at the pace of American uh, business innovation. Um, but a lot of the, the ethical stuff uh, is going to happen at the pace of American legal and government <laughs> innovation, which is radically slower. Um, and I won't even touch the education side of it yet, but uh, you know, the, the differential there, you know, when we saw it with social media, for example, uh, was pretty destructive. Um, and I think we're living through some of the, the destructiveness of that, uh, but when you hear a call, a, a call, even from you know prominent business figures and and, uh, and scholars to sort of slow down the pace of this, you know, my first reaction is how? Like even if even if you want it, even if everybody wants it, and I don't think everybody does, like it's the genie's out of the bottle. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's on GitHub. Um, but what, you know, what's your take on that? Like, how do we, how do we innovate at speed and responsibly? Yeah. Well, and with yeah. society in mind. I mean, I, you know, calling all of the good actors to stop so that the bad actors can just keep going seems like the most flawed <laughs> idea exactly. ever. Um, so that's, yes. that's certainly not the answer in my, in my view, but you know, there's a few things. Like, first of all, you know, I don't, love the term regulatory or, you know, or government controlling or whatever, like no one really does. However, in this instance, 
government's actually pretty good at at supporting the the value of IP. Um, all the stories mm-hmm. of government, you know, re, re renewing the licensing for Disney characters and you know extending and extending. Like I think the government recognizes that this is one of the one of our assets as a as a country. You know, is the brand equity of the IP that we originate. And so I wouldn't, you know, I I, I wouldn't be surprised, or and I and I would hope that there is like some some thought on just like the legislation side that clarifies what can and can't be used for training and, and all that stuff. So, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, one of the, one of my biggest critic critiques of technology as a whole in Silicon Valley, as I know it, is that we tend to be really creative about what can go right. And we fail to be creative about what can go wrong. And, um, and you just have to be willing to have the brainstorm of the shit storm, you know, like, let's really be creative right. here. Like what can go wrong? <laughs> How do we how do we prepare for this? So you know, years ago, you know, we we did this. Um, it was actually when we were doing content aware fill in video, which was in two thousand mm-hmm. and uh, maybe like two thousand and seventeen, two thousand eighteen. Um, we were ena- enabling you to basically remove a object or a moving thing from the video and make it flawless. And we were like, wow, that's a powerful technology that was a comp- was achievable frame by frame and would take like a week to do it. And right. now it's like in seconds. Um, and so what do we, what could go wrong here? And it's obvious what could go wrong there with fake mm-hmm. media and manipulated media and whatever. And so we started something called the Constant Authenticity Initiative and the, it was open source. It's like not DRM, it's not controlled by Adobe. We open sourced it. We invited our competitors to use it. We wanted everyone to add counter credentials to assets that were being made or edited, captured on cameras, edited in tools, so that you could see if an asset has content credentials, you could see who made it and how it was edited. And the hope there Mm -hmm. was so that we could start to discern in our life, like what we could trust and what we probably should not trust by default. And um, and sort of like, uh, you know, seeing a piece of media with that verification or the content credentials, you could be like, oh, well, at least this piece of media is being transparent with me about who made it and how it was made. And it's metadata, it's cryptographic. Right. Like, so maybe I can trust this from the New York Times as opposed to this piece that is not credentialed. Um, and so that, right. and that technology actually now has evolved to a lot of these models out there. We believe that people should know what model was used to create what image if in, in generative AI, because the model tells you something. If it's a, a dirty model, right. Like you might want to know that, especially if you're using it for commercial use. If it's a clean model, you would want to know that as well. And so I think that that's an example of how just companies need to be creative, what can go wrong, and then build new things as a result of those brainstorms. Right. I really like the idea of, of establishing the shit storm as the opposite of a brainstorm or the, the brainstorm of what could go wrong. It's, it means something somewhat different, but I think we could we could make that to, if, if people watching could, uh, could help start to adopt that. I, uh, I fully support Scott in his uh, in his coining a term. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I, uh, I want to transition now a little bit. You wrote a piece that I, I think was really quite prescient. Um, several years ago now, um, called, I believe it's called Creativity is the New Productivity. Um, and talking about kind of, uh, all the work that we've done around productivity, both as at, at an enterprise level, organizational level, and individually, is going to be outsourceable to uh, two machines uh, very soon. Uh, and, and now we're, we're here a few years later and it's happening. Um, can you, I think it's a really compelling idea and I, I'm obviously predisposed to loving that idea cause I'm not the best at productivity and I really enjoy uh, uh, create, creativity in all its forms, uh, consuming and creating it. Um, can you speak a little bit about this in terms of kind of what that inversion that you're talking about looks like and how it's, how it's played out uh, since you wrote it and, you know, is there anything that you were writing about sort of, would you revise any of it or is it really sort of holding, holding firm? Yeah. Well, it was, you know, that was, that writing um, was really around. I mean, one thing that struck me during COVID in the beginning, I noticed that 
all these technologies we rolled out in our teams, like Slack and video calling and, you know, and all these new dashboards and all this like, technology, it wasn't necessarily widely adopted by everyone. You know, there was still the person mm -hmm. who insisted on sending an email every time. There were still some of the people who were still used to in-person meetings and couldn't adapt to having a hybrid meeting or a remote meeting. And then in one fell swoop, within a few weeks, suddenly everyone, everyone got it. You know, and, yep. and it's almost as if we had accrued all this potential gain in productivity over a decade or two, but it hadn't been fully realized. And there needed to be like this forcing function that suddenly made people realize the productivity that frankly, they already had to tap. They just had not been forced to do so. Right. Our old it wasn't habit, evenly distributed yet. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The old adage. Exactly. And so, so, um, so there was this sudden productivity gain in some ways that was always just there. Um, and, uh, and it was pretty magical to see. And I saw it in our company and I saw it in my friends' companies. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, it enabled us to survive and in some ways thrive in COVID as businesses. Um, it also, it also gave me a sense of, oh, but wait, it, this is, you know, now it's going to become more rapid, like this jump in adoption. And then with the advent of AI on the horizon, it became very clear to me that what has always gotten us promoted for decades and decades, maybe even centuries, was no longer going to work, right? We always be mm. were promoted about what we got done, and 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 the more papers stamped, the more passports looked at, the more numbers crunched, the faster, the better. The you know, the more productive you were, the more successful you were, and uh, and I do think that there is a point at which productivity is going to be, to your point, so offloaded to AI. In fact, every repetitive task you do will be done automatically for you because your computer will be hardwired to do that, right? And so everything yeah. you're doing is just training to the algorithm to do it for you, um, that at some point we will no, no longer be promoted for our productivity. We will only be promoted for the new ideas we bring that were on the edge that may someday become the center, um, the new stories yeah. that motivate our people, the you know, the new, the new realizations that sort of change the way we work. It's the creativity that will make us stand out, not the productivity. And so for that to, if, if that's the era ahead, and I certainly think with generative AI and all these other, you know, capabilities and the day by day, yet alone month by month um, uh, uh, rate of change in these technologies, like that is, that is going to be our future. So what are the implications? Oh my goodness. Like education needs to be completely rethought. The fact that we still have yes. art class like once a week on Fridays, you know, in most schools is just absolutely backwards, right? Um, yes. What, you know, the job functions people have, I mean, certain job functions need to be eliminated. Certain layers of management need to be eliminated. I'm not saying people mm -hmm. need to let go. They need to be repurposed. They need to be asked to do things. Yes. Also, like non-scalable things that, you know, humans are really good at doing mm -hmm. things that are non-scalable by, you know, at, by design like talking to people yeah. and empathizing with them. And I imagine we're going to have a lot more people to be able to unleash, um, to engage customers and to like build our brand the mm -hmm. old fashioned way. So I just think we need to start rethinking all of that based on this belief, this assertion that creativity is the new productivity. So I, I'm, I'm in love with it. And it, it, it's so it, something that I've, believe for a long time, it articulates it really well. And it also, the, the other thing about it that, I, that I've talked about a lot, but I think is made more sort of foundational by the lens that you put on it is that, that you know, having one metric to rule them all, which is really what the entire industrial and post-industrial age has been, efficiency is everything. Um, you're always, by definition, in a sense, in a state of incremental improvement. And the, the really disruptive changes are few and far between. And I think because we've only a few people have really ever been able to focus on that at any given time. But the thing that creates anything that, that is really of, of tremendous value that creates an entirely new economy or an entirely new division of a business um, is not because something got incrementally better. It's because something disruptive happened. Mm -hmm. And that is the result of 
creative thinking, not efficiency. You know, nobody thinks if innovation comes from efficient meetings. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, the, everything that I've learned about ideas and how innovation really happens is that it's a lot more about serendipity. It's about taking a walk with something in mind and seeing something that triggers it or meeting someone who thinks a different way. Um, and we've actually engineered those types of interactions and those catalytic opportunities out of business yeah. for the most part in service of, of efficiency. And so my optimistic view of, of what you're writing is if this is true, this is going to lead to radical positive, potentially ra radical positive changes, not just for people's individual work lives, but for everybody's life, because yes. we're clearly capable of creating massively disruptive, positive things, but we are, the vast majority of our economy is focused on something else. You know, I, I, uh, I think about this a lot. Um, I forget who suggested to me that uh, when you think about chat GPT and generative AI, think about it in terms of you're asking, what would it look like if, like, that's what you're mm -hmm. asking. Like, what would it look like if I made an ad for a pizza company, you know, it's like, and what it's doing is it's looking at every ad that was ever made for a pizza company and it's giving you something that looks like a pizza company ad, right? And so, and right. you know, the dirty little secret is creativity is the world's greatest recycling program. You know, we are putting together mood boards, we're observing, we're going to ad awards, we're absorbing all this data. And then um, we, through inference in our heads, not in computers, we spit things out and, I think a common mm -hmm. critique of the creative industry is that we typically recycle a lot of stuff. And that's why like every direct to consumer brand in 2016, all look the same and whatever. <laughs> but then the best, you know, the, the best, you know, the best in all of us is when we bring something new. Right. So I've thought about that. I'm like, mm -hmm. where does that come from? If, if it's all recycling and the computer is doing the same thing our brain is doing, it's seeing everything that's out there, it's deducing and it's showing us what something would look like if, right. And I was thinking about it. And so it's interesting, like the way these models work is that it, it applies random numbers um, to generate this like inference, this difference, and then it spits something that's new, right? The mm -hmm. random numbers in our heads are coming from our emotion and our background and our pain mm -hmm. and our story and our anguish and like all that stuff. Yep. In some ways, like the reason why what we're spitting out is not exactly what's in the mood board we built is it's the impulse of those random numbers, except our random numbers come from something, whereas the inference yes. random numbers come from nothing. And maybe right. when people say, you know, Casey Neistat, uh, who, you know, you know, and is a friend of mine and a famous vlogger, you know, he does these like amazing, and he yeah. did this, uh, he, to, to prove a point, he was like, I'm gonna have chat GPT write an entire script end to end of direction and lines and everything of my next vlog. And he did it line by line. And it was pretty hilarious. Mm -hmm. like, it was like a tour of New York. Yeah. And he was like, yo, now I'm in my favorite place with one of my favorite, you know, uh, one of my favorite views of New York. And then it's like an escalator, you know? And then he, <laughs> and he's like, this is one of my favorite spots. And he looks at the camera, he's like, you know? And, and, and after, you know, after, I gotta watch after that. this, you know, after this vlog, he puts it up. And then afterwards he has like a post-mortem piece in it. And he's like, listen, that was the worst video I've ever made in my life. And I'm trying to figure mm -hmm. out why. And I believe it's simply because it had no soul. And that mm -hmm. really struck me. And I'm like, yeah, because that is what Casey does. He like injects some soul, some pain, some experience like into his work. So the good news is that, you know, AI will never have that in my view. It will be able to yeah. more accurately show us what it means to do something what it would look like, it'll become extraordinarily good at that. You know, but it won't yeah. have soul. Right, it's a really good what if engine. Like visualize, yeah, it, I think that's a really nice lens to put on it. And as you were talking before the before the KC uh, example, I was thinking like, wow, we're really talking about the soul now, aren't we? And it's true, it's true. Because what informs our taste and our opinions is a, a lifetime of, you know, uh, uh, of successes and failures and feelings and, uh, you know, where we came from. I used to want to create something called the frame of reference reference. 
because the difference between my cultural references and somebody who's just a few years older or younger than me are actually pretty substantial. Uh, and so if you could kind of say, oh, I was, I, you know, grew up, these were my formative years and this was somebody else's, like, here's the overlapping area and here are the references I might make that would sit outside of that. And that would be every bit as interesting as the stuff that we would, would share. Um, and there's no frame of reference overlap with a computer, uh, right. with a machine. It's super interesting. And, and, you know, this could be a multi-hour conversation on its own, but I want to, I want to jump on a little bit. Um, as much as it kind of pains me to, uh, you have a new role at Adobe. Uh, and I was very excited for you, obviously, when I saw it. But also I was excited about what I, what I thought it meant that you are both in charge of, uh, of all the design products and the creative products, but also you're the chief strategy officer. And, um, you know, for me, this is, uh, this is, you know, one of our people is like, you know, really directing not just how, what products need in them and how they might evolve, uh, but really the overarching strategy of what does a massive, uh, a product suite, a series of product suites with massive use and uh, user base, uh, what, are, what does it value and what's important going forward? Um, that's that's my analysis of it from knowing almost nothing. But I'd, I'd, I guess I'm curious for your take on uh, on the role. Um, obviously, it's a very intentional thing to uh, to have that uh, that combination of uh, of mandates. Um, what does it mean? Well, I think the uh, you know, personally, I just I couldn't be more excited about some of these things we're talking about right now. And, um, and these are complex, we need to think out of the box. Um, and Adobe has both the opportunity and the responsibility, I think, to be a, a leader on this front. I mean, we have to think about how do we protect and help artists monetize their IP, you know, in this modern world? How do we also make sure that we outfit creatives to leverage this technology? We can't pretend it's not there in a responsible way. Um, how do we make sure that the creators you know, that are making these assets and the and the and the marketers that are leveraging them and optimizing them and using some of this new technology. Like how do we have the rhyme and reason for how these folks work together? So more than ever before, the for me at least, like the strategy of Adobe, you know, which is to help the world create digital experiences. Um, uh, it was starting to all the dots were like suddenly all sort of more visible, you know, than ever before mm -hmm. uh, for me. And you know, and credit to Shantanu, our CEO, who also sees this and you know, and was willing to give me kind of a, the challenge here to help um, help us navigate and 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 evolve the company's purpose. You know, narrative. You know, in this in this landscape, it's always been very important for me to. Um, I feel like design is the source of truth for what is in production and what's coming, and uh, mm -hmm. and so design end to end. You know, every pixel of every product that's live across all of our businesses is done by our design organization, which is now in one in one team. Um, and so mm -hmm. I can really start to, uh, in some ways, hold some of the teams in the company, the engineering product teams accountable for the experience we, we want to ship. You know, let's make sure that we're shipping what we want to ship. Like sometimes our designers say, that's right. not what I designed. And I, I want to I wanna help, help, help us get better there. And then on the emerging products front, you know, we have a number of emerging products that we're really excited about that we just need to um, ensure don't get swallowed by the beast, you know, and, and, and so right. companies, I've become like very fascinated by how you innovate within companies. I found that, find that small teams are sometimes more, more uh, successful than big teams. You know, I find that if yeah. you're tucked into a core business that has like a real quarter by quarter cadence, it's a little harder to innovate than if you're out, you know, and, and have a little bit more autonomy. And so we've been doing that with the three and immersive business, which is now one of our fastest growing businesses over recent years. And, and um, products like Adobe Podcast and Firefly and others, and so uh, with this with this role, I get to you know help help be a steward of that more throughout the company, which I'm really excited about. So that's the idea, and uh, you know mm -hmm. too early to see. Uh, I'm I'm still uh, you know dust is still settling, but it's 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 pretty fun, and um, and we've got a lot to figure out in a good way. Yeah, of course. Well, this I mean, there's always going to be a lot to figure out if we're doing our jobs right, and. Right. Uh, 
but I think it's exciting. And, and I think, you know, I've always thought of uh, design on, on some level as sort of strategy visualized. So the fact that they are going together at a company as important and impactful uh, as Adobe is, I think, a really exciting sign. I hope that that uh, not only are you tremendously successful in the role, but that it's a model for how other organizations might start to think. Well, thanks. I'll, I'll, so, we're going to try and, and uh, empowering designers has frankly always been kind of the cheat code of my career, honestly, um, especially in big strategy conversations where people love to hear themselves speak and, you know, look at graphs and charts and stuff and everyone's disagreeing. And then suddenly you just show a great prototype and everyone's like, yeah. oh, <laughs> And everyone suddenly starts to nod their heads and it's sort of like the hot knife through the butter of bureaucracy. You just get everyone aligned. (laughs) And uh, so those are the moments I kind of professionally, at least, those are the moments I live for. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. So uh, this, this series, so the series live likes to, uh, likes to end on inspiration. And I always have trouble asking people like, where do you find your inspiration? Because I personally hate, uh, being asked myself, but uh, h- how about have you stumbled on anything really interesting that we can send our audience to uh, recently? Hmm. For inspiration, um, you know, for me, it's personally always been both for inspiration and for humility, like just seeing what the creative world is capable of and what people are making. It's like, yeah. wow, the talent out there. So you know, that was, that was what inspired Behance. And that's, you know, I, I continue to make sure I preserve time in my life for just immersing myself in other people's work and getting inspired, you know, just by what's possible. Um, but in terms of, I mean, lately what I've been doing is I've been following a lot of, a lot of uh, people on, on Twitter who are just, you know, in their, in their sort of earlier of their career. So they're not, too pigeonholed into any one technology. And so they're just playing a lot with AI and sort of the, the advent of this thing called baby, um, baby GPT and auto GPT. Like there's mm-hmm. some of these technologies that are basically having AI like prompt itself and stuff. And I find it pretty inspiring to see tinkers. And that we're, we're at this precipice of an entirely new platform shift where so much of our daily lives and decisions are going to be done through like agents that we work with every day Mm -hmm. that sort of guide us, that help protect us. You know, there's going to be a lot more sophisticated scams in the future, unfortunately, as a result of this tech. And you kind of need a little agent in your ear being like, Michael, don't respond to that email or don't click that link, (laughs) especially when we're in our eighties, we're definitely going to need this. Right. And um, so I I'm I'm super interested in people that are tinkering because I feel like that's always a, how you socialize, you know, the future. Absolutely. I, it's, it's interesting you say that because I've found myself spending more time on GitHub than ever before right. lately, just to see what people are playing with and, uh, and how people are taking uh, elements of someone's, you know, open source project and branching off of that in interesting ways. And I'm not a, a, a coder, but I, I, I find it, I find it almost as viscerally exciting as going to Behance and looking at people's portfolios now. And uh, uh, my favorite one, which I'll try to do really quickly, someone created an open source, um, uh, an open source karaoke management system. And uh, someone did a branch off of it that you know you could use any video on YouTube because there's every karaoke song you could possibly want on YouTube. But someone else created one where you could actually, it ran it through an AI library that removes the vocals from the actual song. Huh. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a, a, a simulation of the song and then automatically tracks the lyrics wow. uh, perfectly in time and produces that in nearly real time for you. And like, you know, that's a whole bunch of rights issues waiting to happen, of course, but it's also like somebody just did that on their free time. That's yep. tremendously exciting. And it's, uh, it's, you know, back to the creative confidence point, more people feel the confidence to take their ideas and play with them and make them happen. Yeah. That's gotta be good for humanity. Um, but we have to, uh, we have to navigate 
a lot of the issues as well that protect the integrity of creativity. And so that's like, that would be kind of like the, the tension I think we're going to navigate yeah. over the next decade or so, but we'll figure yeah. it out. We yeah. always do. So I don't know, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I think we will. Well, I'm with you. I think, you know, if the, we've, we've done all right, we've had some, definitely some, some, uh, some, negatives but we've done all right over the last few decades of change we're still here and we're still yeah. doing stuff um well thank you this was a real treat i could go on forever i have to welcome back our hosts now um but that was great no michael appreciate it thank you scott thanks for having me absolutely thank you yeah. both yeah thank you both just a couple i just wanted to share a couple just quick quick thoughts and some some of the discussion in the group um, one person commented in particular and I really agreed with this is, you know, they just appreciated the the honesty of this conversation, but also mm -hmm. a focus on optimism and kind of productive thinking about like, what can we do with this? Because, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of scaremongering out there. And look, we're right to be, we're right to be discerning, uh, but really appreciate that, that kind of tone in that, that tenor. Um, I, I loved Scott, the, you know, equal parts brainstorming um, with, with equal parts shit storming. I think there should be a new mantra. <laughs> That's my favorite part. New mantra that. for, for all of us. Um, loved some of these thoughts about, um, you know, AI really moving us up kind of the productivity curve. You know, yeah. we, we chatted in the chat room a little bit as a lot of internet technology, unfortunately, has moved us far up the distraction curve. Um, but without, you know, and economists have written about this too, without some of the subsequent gains in productivity that we really would have loved to see with internet technology. And I think AI really could, you know, be the layer that really starts to, to move that productivity needle in a, in a, in a positive way. So, um, but, but many other just great comments in the group and really, really appreciate you carving out time um, to, to do this. I feel a lot more optimistic and, and happier and, and energized uh, just coming out of this conversation. So thanks, Tom. No, it's a pleasure, and you know, it's it's communities like yours um, that uh, that are the forums for us to figure all this stuff out. I mean, every time I'm engaged in one of these conversations, I always take away some things myself that I want to take back to the teams and or think about differently. So it's super helpful. And thanks for hosting this. Awesome. Well, thank you both again so much. Thank you everyone online for joining us today. Thanks for all the great conversation in the chat. Um, please join us next month for our next edition of Soda Series Live that takes place on May 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. We will have Ian Barry from Soda member agency Lane Terry for joining us. We'll see you then. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Kristen. We'll see y'all.